un coche. ອົງຫນຶ່ງເບຣະປະກາດມັນໂຕໃຫ້ຍຸນາການໃນ <cười> ការវិធីថ្ងៃទីសាមសិបមួយខែឧទ្យភាឆ្នាំ <cười> Ban vực kia sáng đào rút mà hai, nơi chưa phục mục ong chân yu bè. Ba yu 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 សូមគោរពលោកធានសម្រាប់សព្វនាការនៃការបង្ហាញឯកសារគុណលឺនៅថ្ងៃនេះគ្រប់ភាគីទាំងអស់នៃរឿងក្តីនេះមានវត្តម
đầm bay chơi chìm nuôi đào ong chìm rác nông cao vi đầm lầy lư đầm lầy này phong tang nơi phía đại ong chìm rác vừa cả lăng thay để lư tùng nguồn này phong tang từng nút bọn to pí sạm na cao vi phía xa đánh đào lư phong tang trai ban bị chọc mà giang tiết sạm na cao đi có đầm bay chui đào sạt thì lại chốn du lịch ban căn tài chính ban nơi ai cả xá tiền lai để ban về phía xa để đào để về cái lòng mớ đời xa tay rồi một đường cái đây là dục mục miền tùng phong thôm hơi sầm sầm tôi chỉ dừng đặt giang đi cái đấy bây giờ vi khư sầm phong còn đôi chỉ chuyên chụp chao mình ban phá phá nợ cả để ao nhầm rẻ ban phá đỏ để mấy con thầm quan rửa thay thì bay lựa ai cả xa tiền lai để ban được bằng hai đại phiệt kim sinh chết chỉ bị xe phí sầm nạ hạ về nhà để về cái lòng mớ một lời còn đây còn tại đam bay chia bảy giao cho dân thị thua ông nhầm rẽ nơi tại bắc đảo về về lía đào chuyên cho cháu khi dùng phón nâng công bây giờ bị cà phê cây bạc cốt vừa cà cọt sầm cốt rưỡi cọt thua thà thì bài lưỡi mình đại cái xa tiền lái đây là từ ban đạo bằng hai đại phiệt kỳ đầu tây tiết được nông sản là cá cà đạo bằng bằng hai nơi ai cà xa cùng lư tại ban thưa cái lòng mớ và sân bay chuyên cho cháu khi dùng phón nâng bây giờ bị cà phê cây bạc cốt ở miền bằng nông thưa được chưa này ở trại hành ni ông nhầm ra với cả bài chạy pi về lý này cả bằng hai ai cả sao còn lướt nâng pi về lý làm rập cốt thằng quan rư ắt thà thì bài tiền nâng cả bằng hai ai cả sao còn lướt đi hàng cầu này xã bình nhã ông hai xã cần cam rúm nâng tổng rung này cả tổ thuộc tử pi thằng ngày tu nền ti đã bao chuyên chụp cháu mùi thằng ngày địa pi giờ rốc làm rập xã bình nhã miền địa pi bảy thằng ngày sẽ bị tử vi nôm mốc nằm nang đau mà đang rập rập vì ní ông hai sẽ cần cầm rúm nâng tầm rung để cao tới tu khổ tử mùi thằng ngày để tu này ti được bảo chuyển chụp chao cùng lạc thằng ngày về về lia sập rốc sập rập sẽ bị tử vi nôm mốc miền địa về mùi thằng ngày cùng lạc bây giờ vi cao biết cái đây lục nôn chi ông hai sẽ cần cầm rúm nâng tầm rung để cao tới tu khổ tử cùng lạc thằng ngày tôi này tì được bao chuyện chụp chao còn là thằng ngày địa phê giờ rốc tầm rạm bây giờ bị cà phê cái đây nôn chí bây giờ phê một thằng ngày bây giờ bị cà phê cái đây lục khiêu sầm phòn ai cả xa cướp lục hết chẳng ngọt đại bộ quật là sống vừa cà cọt tổng quá rồi cất vừa thà thì bái còn là thằng ngày và chưa bắt đầu từ ní ao nhiệm đây bắt đầu bị thì cà chun tới đầm nang sa bảy nhá lau bằng hai ai cả xa còn lư đại quân du lịch tham viên trả về giàu đầm bay chơi chìm nuôi đầu ông chìm rác nông cao vì đầm lấy phật táng vẽ quan tình đường ông hết sạ cắt cầm rúm tụm rung đi cả tụ tụ khổ tử hay nâng mặt to cứ nâng tuôn đi ti đầu bọc chuyển chụp chào xong chưa nhỉ Mr. President, Your Honours, good morning. Uh, good morning to my fellow council. In this document presentation on the alleged joint criminal enterprise relating to the forced movements of the civilian population first and second phase, the co-prosecutors will present documentation it considers to be of particular relevance to assist the trial chamber in determining the truth. The documents deal with the following issues and events. Number one, core party lines of the CPK which predated the forced movements of the civilian population. These party lines are documented in official CPK publications such as the CPK statute and issues of the revolutionary flag. Central to CPK ideology was the need to dry up the enemy and drain the civilian population. Number two, 
examples of the policy of draining the population and the forced movement of the civilian population by reference to events in Krache, Kampong Cham, Siem Reap, the Eastern Zone, the Southwest Zone, and in particular, the events in Udon in March 1974. Number three, comments made by Q Sampong in a speech delivered in North Korea on the 5th of April 1974, within weeks after the attack on Udon, as well as official documentation issued at the same time, also commenting on the attack of Udon. Number four. The movements of Q Sampon and Ian Sari as the main representatives in a group delegation during an official tour of Vietnam, China, and other countries in Europe and Africa during the period from the 27th of March 1974, returning to Peking in late May 1974. Number five, the decision to evacuate the population of Phnom Penh, including evidence of a meeting between Pol Pot and Ian Sari in June 1974 and comments by Nguyen Chia as to the nature of the decision-making process and the use of democratic centralism. Number six, examples by way of telegrams of the movement and execution of civilians in late 1974. Number seven, a United States government report dated the 17th of March 1975 prepared for potential use with the United States Congress and media, citing particular incidents against the civilian population by the communists in the lead-up to the evacuation. Number eight, the contents of speeches delivered by Q Sampong in the lead-up to the first forced movement and documents showing where he was and who he was with. And number nine, statements by Ian Sari to foreign journalists providing purported justification for the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Can I start then, please, Mr. President, by reference to document number E3-214. This is the CPK statute, and I will be referring to one article. The English ERN is 00184033. The Khmer 0053. Zero one eight stroke nine French double zero two nine two nine two three. This is Article four of the statute. Uh, the heading is party discipline, and this will come up, I hope, on the screen as I start speaking. Article 4, number 1, in order to maintain and to consolidate internal party solidarity and unity to be always good, the party has designated and raised the principle of respect for party discipline and organization. Party discipline is very firm 
but stands on the principle of awareness of each individual party member. Each party member, regardless of position, must absolutely respect and follow party discipline. Respecting party discipline and organization is respecting the party political line party ideological principles and stances, party organizational stances and party statutes. Number two, any party member or any party echelon opposing the party political line, party ideological stances, party organizational stances, and party statutes causes fractures in internal party uh, solidarity uh, and unity and creates groups to carry out activities to destroy the party. The next document is E3-16. This is an extract from a book by Q. Sampong entitled, and I quote, Considerations on the History of Cambodia from the Early Stage to the Period of Democratic Cambodia. Close quote. The extract I wish to refer to is English ERN 00498231. Khmer 0038-0267 and French 0064-3834. And here under a heading of D, the new line of the new party, Q. Sampon stated as follows, and I quote, This line specified that the exploiting classes were the primary enemy of the Cambodian Revolution and the tools of the American imperialists. Thus, the Cambodian people had to smash the feudalist regime, whether by peaceful methods or by other methods. The next document is from E3-18. This is a book by Q. Songpong entitled Cambodia's Recent History and the Reasons Behind the Decisions I Made. The ERNs are 00103778, and I hope the document can come up on the screen this time. Khmer 00103873, and French 00594848. The general heading of the extract is the accelerated communization of the country, and the particular extract reads as follows. The Khmer Rouge victory on April the 17th, 1975, strengthened Pol Pot's conviction that the only way to ensure the movement's survival and thus for Cambodia to face the Vietnamese threat, a threat he believed to be even more dangerous after reunification, was the forced collectivization of the country.
Staying on that document, if I may, put some different ERN numbers. English ERN 0-1-0-3-7-7-6. Khmer 0-0-1-0-3-8-7-0. French 0-0-5-9-5-4-7-9-6. Through to eight zero. So again, still on this book by Q. Sampong. And I quote. Since then, I learned from various internal party documents and from the stories of various zone or region leaders that the daily social conflicts in the cities as well as in the countryside, though seemingly minor, were actually breeding grounds for the CPK to train leaders to work in various types of mass organizations. But the movement soon revealed itself to be far more vulnerable in the cities than in the countryside. According to the documents, quote, the enemy's repression machine is more sophisticated there, where workers are often tarnished by capitalism, whereas the countryside is wider and more protected from it. In the countryside, aside from the developing peasant associations, the first self-defense units were taking place. Young peasants practice handling ropes, first to tie oxen, and using kramas, bamboo canes, etc. Basically, whatever was available that could be used as weapons to fight the most tyrannical commune chiefs, their deputies, forestry and fishery guards, or anyone who might try to take over their land or the land of their families. In some regions, the local authorities' secret agents who were caught spying on important party meetings were sometimes tied up and physically eliminated. The next document is E3-5. This is an extract from Revolutionary Flag, Issue 8, August 1975. The extract is English 0040-1492. The Khmer is 0006332-9. And the French 00538966. And this is on the subject of secret defense units. And I quote, Secret defense units were organized at every location among the people. The peasants, the workers, the laborers, and the students that were armed, whether they bore arms legally or illegally, were the secret defense unit of the party. What mission did they have? The mission of the secret defense unit was to defend the revolution's base areas, to defend the revolution's people, to defend the cadres moving around working, and to defend the assemblies and the various meetings. And, in tandem with this, to covertly 
smash the enemy. The government agents and the various reactionaries, in order to defend the party, the revolution, and the people. Close quote. The next document is E3-25. This is another CPK publication. This is the revolutionary flag special issue, December 1976, stroke January 1977. The extract is English ERN 00491424. Khmer 00063039-40 and French 00504049-50 and the heading for this extract is and I start quoting attacking the enemy politically. Taking just one example, fighting to seize the people. Throughout the world, they never fought to seize the people. Our line was to fight to seize the people. One, we took him. Two, we took them. One hundred, we took them. One thousand, we took them. And so on, until we fought for and seized the people from Phnom Penh too. The line of drying up the people from the enemy was very correct. This never happened in the world. When the enemy has the people, the enemy has a military and an economy. When the enemy has no people, the enemy has no military and no economic strength. Our reasoning is correct. Thus, our line is very correct. We fight to seize the people at every location. An example, the fighting in Banam in 1973, we took everyone in Banam town, expelling the ethnic Vietnamese, the ethnic Chinese, the military, the police, we took everyone drying up the people from the enemy. And further down the page, an example. We liberated Udong in 1974. We pulled out all the people. This is a very important strategic line. Control the people and seize the people. Mr. President, I just want to check why this page and other pages have not come up on the screen. Can, you, can I please just have one moment? The next document is E3-1108. This is an official CPK report with a signature at the end of the document. And it's a report regarding a meeting to celebrate the start of resistance 
uh, in Amlien district. So this was a meeting which took place on the 30th of September 1974. The front page is English ERN 005 83819. That is Khmer 0038-3754-5 and French 0078-8350. The report is entitled Subject. The meeting to celebrate the enemy's 23rd anniversary meeting and Hu Yun's speech. On the 30th of September 1974, a commission of the Communist Party of Cambodia's Central Committee gathered to celebrate the anniversary of the 23-year-old history of resistance in Amlien district. The event was held with the participation of many people in the Khmer Rouge's framework, party members and Khmer People's National Liberation Armed Forces from different places who all dressed in black. On the same English ERN page, but Khmer moving forward one page to 00383, Seven five five. Still on the same French page, we see that the attendees of this meeting included Chu Chet, described as the chief of the Southwest Zone. At number three in a list, Tamok, commander of the Southwest Zone. And then moving on a number of pages to Khmer page 00383756, English 00583821, and French 00788352. We see that the other persons in attendance at this meeting were at number 47, Salos Sa, Secretary of the Party. Number 48, Hu Yun, Ministry of Interior, in charge of organizing rural and cooperatives. At number 50, Tiv O, the Deputy Secretary of State of the Ministry of Propaganda. At number 3, Khoi Thun, the Deputy Secretary of State of the Ministry of Finance, and at number 54, Comrade Ken, or Noor Puisara, also a member. Moving on to the next Khmer page, which is 00383757, French 00788353. And English 00583822. This meeting is described in the following terms, and I quote At the beginning, Chu Che announced the opening of the program. The sound of microphone emitted, ordering all comrades to roll down their sleeves, fasten the collar buttons, take off the hats, and prepare to salute the party's flag. Audience and military cadres saluted quietly. The party's anthem emitted. Blue curtain opened slowly, and blood-red cloth with its size of about four meters appeared. On the cloth, there was an emblem of a sickle and a hammer right in the center of the red cloth, which is the same as that of the Soviet's emblem. They clenched their fists and saluted silently. After that, 
Hu Yun went on the stage and delivered a very long speech of three hours, during which he talked about Communist Party of Kampuchea's 23-year-old history of resistance, and he gave advice to high-profile military cards. Moving on now to some extracts from Hu Yun's speech. Can I please turn to Khmer page 00383759, French 00788354, and English 00583823. This is Hu Yun talking about Yun the history of the party's organization, and I quote. For that reason, the party's organization did not participate under the ruling of the feudalists and loyalists. The organization has organized its cadres into three groups. One group was sent to study in North Vietnam. Another group was sent to do political movements in the city, and the last group was sent to establish political movements in rural area. Another extract from the speech, Khmer page 00383763. French 00788356 and English 00583824 and I quote Later on the organization implemented a plan according to the slogan of the first phase attacked the countryside, surround the city, which was the second phase. In the implementation of the plan, achieved considerable success. Hence, in 1971, the organization decided to oblige all of its military cars to leave Vietnam's military units by shifting to self-reliance. And the final extract from the speech of Hu Yun, Khmer ERN 00383766, French 00788357, English 00583826. And these are instructions from Hu Yun to the military cadre. And I quote, From now on, the military cadres must liberate the whole country. However, please bear in mind that before we attack the outside enemy, we must attack the enemy inside each of us first. Comrades must make a clear distinction between friends and enemy and must adopt the following stance. One, labor stance. Two, political stance. Three, solidarity stance. Four, ideological stance. And five, organization stance. The next document is E3 slash 118. This is an extract from Phibis for April 1975. The heading of the extract is Kim Sampong, 21st April. 
And this was a broadcast made by QSOMPO on the 21st of April 1975. And the broadcast has a further heading, Congratulatory Statement by RGNUC, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of National Defence and CPN LAF Commander-in-Chief to CPN LAF units and Cambodian people live or recorded. And the extract on English 00166994, Khmer 00846160 through 61, and French 00845854 through 55 is as follows. Khmer ERN again is zero zero eight four six one six zero slash six one and I quote This is our nations and peoples greatest historic victory. Our entire nation, people and CPN as well as people throughout the world and in all friendly countries far and near, warmly welcome this great victory. It has opened the most brilliant and righteous path which led the Cambodian people and and the CPNLAF in waging the powerful people's war to fight the enemy on every field, military, political, economic, and in its efforts to drain the population from controlled areas, successively smashing all enemy maneuvers, relentlessly attacking and draining the enemy of its military, political, economic and financial strength, food and rice until it reached the point from which it could not recover. Finally, the enemy died in agony. Close quote. The next document is E3-22. This is an extract from Cambodian Communism by Steve Hedda. The ERNs are as follows, English, 00393831, and the Khmer is 00846160. Can I say for the person who's uh, behind me, I am not certain of that Khmer ERN, as I believe that this book had not been translated into Khmer. But in any event, it's Cambodian Communism by Steve Edder. It's talking about events in 1973 to 1971, and he states as follows. Already in late 1970, early 1971, the Vietnamese Workers' Party, while it remained predominant, and the CPK as it took control, increasingly relied on the pressure of their armed power to maintain and extend their control. 
where the Vietnamese military operated in overwhelming force, it sealed off the liberated zones from the rest of the country, enforcing a ban on population movements between them, a policy that the Cambodian communists inherited and reinforced. Many rural folk felt trapped in the liberated zones, reluctantly acquiescing to communist control, whether Vietnamese or Cambodians. They fled when they could from a revolution that enjoyed even less support, sorry, less popular support than in southern Vietnam. And on the next page, which is English ERN 00393832, there is the following extract, and I quote, As the CPK became more politically autonomous of the Vietnamese Workers' Party in 1971-1972, much of the population remained cynical distrustful and fearful of a revolution that maintained its position through threats and executions. As the CPK expelled the Vietnamese armed forces in 1972-1973, it replaced their military domination with increasingly extreme coercion to ensure peasant compliance with its demands. The CPK became even more violent and repressive after mid-1973, when it radicalised its policies, insisting on the formulation of agricultural cooperatives in the zones under control, curtailing the practice of religion, imposing even stricter prohibitions on villagers' movements, and mobilising the population for attacks on Phnom Penh. And later in this extract, I quote, the CPK never convinced the majority that the revolution it was pushing forward was in their interests. Coercion, force and threats maintained only the semblance of mass support and of the popular success of the National People's Democratic Revolution. The next document is E3-597. This is an extract from Le Monde, entitled Interview with a Cambodian Revolutionary. The French ERN is 007-222. Four five through four four Khmer zero 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 one of the historical leaders of the Cambodian Revolution. He, who soon will return to the underground, reveals here for the first time to a foreign journalist his views on the evolution of his country. And the date of this uh, report is the 15th of January, 1972. Ing Siri was asked, how practically do you organize the power of the people? And Ying Siri gave this reply. In the vast liberated zone, we have applied the FUNC program. It rests on the principle by which the people are the source of all power. At all admi administrative levels, from the hamlets, the villages, and the districts, and the provinces, committees are functioning as the state apparatus. Each committee is composed of three 
three, five, or seven members, according to the importance of its echelon. Each member is assigned one or more specific duties, political, military, security, economic, cultural, social affairs, etc. And then later in the article on Khmer page 007-44039, English 00003964, and one page on again in the French document, there is this extract. Thus, our popular armed forces have rapidly organized and developed themselves on all these levels and are composed of three principal forces. The guerrilla units, the regional forces, and the regular forces, all placed under the command of a national military committee and its staff. At the level of each military region, there is a military committee and a regional staff. The next document, Mr. President, is E3-37. This is the record of the questions and answers which took place before the co-investigating judges and Q. Sampong on the 15th of December 2007. And the extract to which I seek to make reference is on English page 001675. Six, Khmer page zero zero one five six six seven seven through seven eight and French zero zero one five six six eight four. Q. Sampong was asked this question by Marcel Le Monde, the co-investigating judge, and I quote, Did you agree with the content of those speeches And if you disagree with the content, could you give us an example of such disagreement? And the answer was, Generally, I agreed with the content. The next document is E3-637. This is a statement made by Q. Sampong, Hu Yun, and Hu Nim in January 1973. It also talks about events 9th of September 1972. The official start of the document is on English 007409. Sorry. 0931. I'm going to repeat that ERN. 0074093 in English. 0042333 in Khmer. And in French. 0072174. So again, document number E3 slash 637. The document is headed statement by and then lists Q Sampon, Hu Yun, and Hu Nim. Going into the statement itself, at page English 0074938, Khmer 0044-2332, and French 0075-2174, there is the following quotation. All in all, up to mid-January 1973, the Campuchian 
People's Liberation Armed Forces and our people have obtained great victories. We have smashed a total of 10,245 heads of the enemies and liberated dozens of bases. Attached to the general report is a special report, and we find the front page of the special report at English RN 0074-0939, that is French 0075-2175, and Khmer 0044-2333. And the special report has this title. I quote. Special report. I accompanied Mr. Deputy Prime Minister Kyusampong to visit the provinces of Preveher, Kampong Pong, and Siem Reap. Close quote. And then the document itself starts with these words. From the 25th of November 1972 through to the 15th of December 1972, I accompanied Mr. Deputy Prime Minister Q. Sampong to visit Priyavihir, Kampong Thom and Siem Reap. And still in the body of this special report, we see at page English ERA, 0074093 Khmer 00422336337 and French 0075217 the following extracts and this is the person who's reporting on the visit with Kyusampong to these areas. I quote, Our people know who are friends and enemies very clearly, and they hold absolute grudge against the enemy. Everywhere we went, people, including men, women, children, and elderly people, warmly welcomed Deputy Prime Minister Q. Sampong with great joy. Before leaving for a new place, people just came to shake hands with Mr. Deputy Prime Minister with love and miss and requested him to visit their place again. People wished Mr. Deputy Prime Minister and through him the front and the royal government of National Union of Kampuchea great victory and splendid strength. Mr. President, I'm moving on now to a number of extracts from a book by Ben Kean entitled How Pol Pot Came to Power. That book is E3-1815. And the next six themes come directly from that book. Can I start please with E3-1815. The English ERA is 0048748. The Khmer is 0010486. My learned colleagues who are listening in French, that there is a partial translation of this book in French, but it does not include translations of the extracts that I'm about to quote, and I have therefore asked for these extracts to be now translated into French. But it will be the Khmer version coming up on the screen and the English version being played. The first extract comes under a title, The Democratic Revolution, 
1973 on the 20th of May 1973, as the US bombardment approached its peak, the CPK Center launched a cooperative cooperativization program, which initially involved organizing peasants into groups of 10, 20, or 30 this had already occurred in many areas, but now land was to be collectivized as well, and the produce of the peasants' labor was to be confiscated by the authorities. In some cases, regulations concerning the destruction of religion and family life and enforced community were also implemented. This was termed the democratic revolution. And the reference for that extract refers to the revolutionary flag of the 8th of August 1975 which is document number E3-5. Ben Kiernan then referred an interview that Steve Hedder had with a CPK member on the 11th and 12th of March 1980. And there is then this quote still within this extract on E3 slash 1815. It talks about an explanation from this soldier and back to the revolutionary flag. And the, the, the following words appear. In the words of the CPK document, we must construct a clean, honest society. What this meant was to be explained in an August 1975 issue of the internal CPK magazine, Tung Padivak, Revolutionary Flags. Its author expressed ambivalence concerning the pre-1973 situation. Quote, there was progress on the one hand and the same old society on the other. Close quote. The next extract from E31815 is to do with the events in Krachi in 1973. The English ERN is 00487489. The Khmer ERN is 00104869. The author refers at the top of the extract with the May 1973 establishment of the cooperatives and then in relation to Krachi states as follows. And I quote, until 1973, we are told, and this is referencing the revolutionary flag E3-5, Karachi Township showed the same signs as in the old society. Honda motorcycles were speeding up and down the streets like before, while our ragged guerrillas walked in the dust. This showed that they were still the masters. They distributed things to the people, mostly commercial equipment. If we had followed that road, we could have gone nowhere. So the party centre had to ensure that the state controlled everything. Krache was evacuated. There was to be no more trading, mortgaging, labor exchanging, or buying on credit. A state monopoly was decreed over rice, salt, fuel, cloth, and petrol. 
without petrol, private owners of trucks, boats and tractors disappeared. The CPK, CPK state took over their equipment. The next extract, still on the same document, is dealing with events in Kampong Cham in 1973. Under a heading, The Northern Zone, the following ERN pages are relevant. English 00487491 and Khmer 00104870. The author states, and I quote, After the bombing had been brought to a halt in August 1973, the soldier from Region 31, and I interject here to explain that that soldier is Mam Lon, I spell M-A-M-L-O-N, he was a sub-district cadre in Region 31, and he was interviewed by Ben Kiernan in Kheng Liev, I'll spell that K-R-A-I-N-G-L-E-A-V, on the 3rd of September 1980. So to carry on, the soldier from Region 31 returned with his unit to Kampong Pong to find that while they had been in Siem Reap, the population movement into the countryside had reversed. 50,000 peasants had now fled into Kampong Pong town. Quote, and this is the quote from the soldier. The countryside was deserted, the villages empty. Close quote. The soldier recalls. This was not just because of the US bombardment of the countryside, which had stopped, or because of aggressive Long Nol Army patrolling, which had resumed. It was also because the CPK Zone Military Commander, K. Polk, had fully implemented the democratic revolution in Region 31. The soldier, and this is still Mam Lon, continues, quote, in the Kampong Tom region, the organization was led by very severe men. Their discipline was terrible. There were many executions. Buddha statutes were destroyed and pagodas secularized. Youths forced to work very hard, especially when the villages had been reorganized and rebuilt. The organization had not allowed the construction of individual houses. There were camps for women, children, young women and young men. Meals were eaten communally and rations consisted only of rice soup without meat. Children were forbidden to respect their parents, monks to pray, and husbands to live with their wives. That letter extract is taken from a book, and please everyone forgive my appalling French. It's from an author called Debre, and the book is called Cambodge, La Révolution de la Forêt from 1976. I'm still continuing with the extract from E3185 about 1973 in the Northern Zone. In September 1973, CPK troops from Region 31 seized half of Kampong Cham city and penetrated to within a hundred meters of the governor's residence. When they withdrew, 
They took 15,000 townspeople into the countryside with them. And that statement is referenced by footnote 318 to a book by William Shawcross entitled Sideshow, Kissinger, Nixon and the Destruction of Cambodia, written in 1979. Still dealing with events in the Northern Zone and still in 1973, but moving to English ERN 00487493, Khmer 00104871. There is then this extract from Mr. Kiernan. And I quote, Changes were also afoot in Siem Reap. Liev Kiel Moni, and I'm going to spell that, L-E-A-V-K-E-O-M-O-N-I, the Hanoi-trained veteran Isarak, who had taken charge of Srei Snam district in 1970, died of natural causes, it seems, in late 1972. Before Moni's death, local communists had carried out their first executions of long old soldiers previously captured and released, who had rejoined Lon Nol's army. The communists also began burning houses and forcibly regrouping the population away from the front lines. But according to the Lon Nol district chief, and that is a reference to a man called Ching Nam Ying, and I'm going to spell that, C-H-H-I-N-G N-A-M Y-E-A-N-G. And that was a man who was interviewed by Ben Kiernan in Rouen on the 11th of October 1979. So, according to the local Lon Nol district chief, speaking in 1979, they rarely kill civilians. Close quote. Moni's death and the increased bombing, however, were followed in 1973 by large-scale executions of all captured Long Nol troops and militia and also of traders, the district chief reports. And again, a quote from the district chief, Ching Nam Yeng. The communists now began to evacuate whole villages with livestock and compile records about everyone rich people had to do forced labor. And moving, if I may, to the southwest zone, still on the Kiernan book, still E3 slash 1815. The English ERM is 00487495. The Khmer ERM 00104873374. So this is now Mr. Kiernan writing about the south western zone, and I quote, but it was the southwestern zone that saw the greatest convulsions in the revolutionary ranks. 1973 was the year that the Mok Putrin tendency closely allied with the CPK center, established its supremacy over Prasit, Chuchet, and their more moderate colleagues, and completely eclipsed the Hanoi tri trained Khmer's throughout the zone. 
The first high-ranking victim was apparently Sangha Huan, and I'm going to spell that, S-A-N-G-A-H-A-H-O-E-U-N, an Isarak veteran and a member of the Zone Committee, a former monk from Kompong Spu, and that is a reference to Chun Samat, C double H U N Samat S A M A T H interviewed by Ben Kiernan in Kong Pisai on the 17th of September 1980. So, a former monk from Kompong Spu, Region 33, who joined the Communists in 1970, recalls. So, this is a quote from that man. In 1971-72, the revolution was good. The people were not worried at all. Sangha Huon was friendly with the Vietnamese and never had any trouble with them. And the people liked Sangha Huon a lot because he sponsored theatre performances with national traditional music. Also, there were plenty of Lon Nol soldiers and intellectuals who came to the liberated zones from Phnom Penh and the province capitals to join the revolution. Sangha Hun and Chu re-educated and taught these people. I saw this. They did not kill them. But Mok did kill such people, and he became angry with what the other two were doing. There was a power struggle. In 1973, the killings began. At first, there were transfers of sub-district and region cadres. Then, Chuchet and his followers fought with Mok's followers at a combined zone and region meeting in our sub-district, which I helped organize. The fight broke out over politics and theory in the middle of the meeting. Chuchet then left for the West to discuss the question of the executions of the Lon Nol soldiers. Puk Chai, and I'm going to spell that, P-H-O-U-K-C-H-H-A-Y, went with him. I was told that they were transferred to Kok Kong. Two weeks later, Sangha Huon was arrested by Mok's troops. At first they took him under guard to our village for a day and a night, and then to the centre or zone headquarters. Five trucks came to take his followers to Kompong Chnam. So that deals with Mr. Kiernan relying on that particular person for that source. Mr. Kiernan then goes on and he mentions in the next words Kenneth Quinn. Kenneth Quinn was an American and this is a reference to one of his publications at footnote uh, 335. And that's a reference to Quinn, political change in wartime, the Khmer Krahom revolution in southern Cambodia, and that was printed in the Naval War College Review in the spring of 1976. So Mr. Kiernan carries on stating as follows. Kenneth Quinn reports that in 1973, Chu Chet had his authority and influence reduced because of his pro-North Vietnam army 
and pro Sihanouk stands, and in fact was even ambushed and slightly wounded by the CPK forces once in late November while traveling with some North Vietnamese army soldiers on Route 16. For the next sentence, Mr. Kiernan relies on his interview with the then named Nu Muk, who gave evidence last week. And that was the interview that we heard of. So, carrying on with the quote from Mr. Kiernan. After his arrival in Kampong Chang, Chu Chet continued to stress solidarity with the Vietnamese at political meetings, reference Mr. Kiernan then speaks about a Yuvakok member in Upper Kompong Tralak district, and that's a reference to a man called Chung Kao, and I'm going to spell that, C-H-H-U-O-N-G, K-A-U, and that was an interview with Ben Kiernan in Kampong Chnang on the 1st of September 1980. A Yuvakok member in the upper Kampong Tralak district there claims that because Chet was an intellectual, he was in constant conflict with a forest revolutionary like Mok. Further, Despite uh, their own experience the at Sihanouk's hands in the 1960s, Chet and others, like Kuk Choi and Khoi Tuan, appreciated Sihanouk's appeal, even if to them he was only a figurehead. The Yuvakot member, in fact, says that, I quote, the people believed in Sihan more than in the revolution. Close quote. Problems arose when the party began to criticize the prince openly, and Mok's response was to impose his authority by force. And then going back to quote Chung Kao. Mok was cruel ever since 1971-72. Unlike Chu Che and Puk Choi, he was fierce, a killer. The killings began in 1973 as the bombs were falling. Also, some prisoners of war were executed and others put in re-education centers. 1973 was the year the US began bombing the area with B-52s, so they had to fight back hard. The killings were in accordance with regulations. This was called strengthening the democratic revolution. No one dared resist the changes. I know for sure from friends who worked directly with Mok that he was the one who ordered the killings. They took place in the forest. Mok had the power, but he did not have much understanding of politics. Puk Choi was educated him, but there was conflict between the forest resistance, people like Mok, and the internal urban resistance, people like Puk Choi, who had recently arrived since 1970. And all those references I've just made are with the footnote referring to Chung Kao. Still on the southwestern zone, but moving to English ERN 0047497. And I hope that's one page on in the Khmer. 
This is Ben Kiernan now talking about Quinn. I've already mentioned Kenneth Quinn and one of his papers, but I'm about to be referring to another document by Quinn. And this document is entitled The Khmer Graham Program to create a communist society in southern Cambodia. And this is an airgram from the United States Consul, Khan Thoth, C-A-N-T-H-O, to the Department of State on the 20th of February 1974. Quinn, who was monitoring developments in the southwestern zone from across the Vietnamese border, reports that local elections were no longer held in the areas newly seized from the Long Nol government from 1973, he says. Village chiefs and sub-district officials were appointed by CPK district committees the number of Buddhist festivals was reduced to two each year, and Cham Muslim ones were totally forbidden. In Kampot in July, so this is a reference to Kampot in July 1973, each Buddhist Wat was ordered to supply ten months to serve as infantrymen in the army's depleted ranks. Soon afterwards, in both Takao and Kampot, regions 13 and 35, all but four monks in each wat were drafted, which Quinn notes decimated the monk population there. At the same time, local towns such as Ang Tasom and Kampong Trak were evacuated. And in rural areas, a large-scale relocation process was implemented. 20,000 people were moved out of their villages in two districts of Kampot alone. Quinn continues, so this is a quote from Kenneth Quinn. In parts of Takao and Kampot, the Khmer communists brought in a large number of new cadres to implement this program, having lost faith in many older cadres whom they considered to be either pro-North Vietnamese or not tough enough to carry it out. Close quote. Popular unrest was also mounting. Quinn cites three incidents in Kampot, Region 35, of popular and military reaction to attempts by CPK cadres to forcibly relocate the population and confiscate rice harvests. Still relying on Quinn, Mr. Kiernan at English page ERN 00487499. I'm afraid I don't have the Khmer page. English, I repeat, 00487499. In early 1973, when the Khmer Krahom, the official CPK forces, entered the new harsh phase of their campaign, in which all rules were strictly enforced 
and unpopular programs carried out with stiff penalties for non-compliance. Almost all popular feeling turned against them. Mr. Kiernan then goes on to select quotations from an interview that he had with a man called Tan Hao, T-A-N-H-A-O, and that took place in Alençon on the 4th of October 1979. So he's talking, Mr. Kiernan, now about Kokong province, and he's referencing his interview with Tan Hao. Region 11 in Kokong province. The ethnic Chinese woman who was living there, Tan Hao, recounts what happened to those she calls the Free Khmer Rouge. In late 1973, the Vietnamese were told to go back to their country, and we saw no more of them. In October or November, the ethnic Chinese revolutionary cadres all disappeared as well, and the Chinese force was dissolved. Only the Khmer force remained. In 1974, hard times began. Zone and regional armed forces from Kompong Sela arrived in Kokong. They included many women. A person called Pacha was arrested and taken away. They said he was going to study, but actually they killed him. Everybody in Kokong was afraid because their leader had been taken away. Prasit, P R A S I T H disappeared about the same time. It got harder and harder. The Khmer Rouge began killing people. People who did anything wrong were taken away and shot. In 1974, they recruited every youth 16 years old or more into the army. Some who didn't go were killed. The next extract, we're now moving on to Mr. Kiernan writing about the Eastern Zone. English ERM 0048706, Khmer 00104880 through 1. It was only in mid-1974 that the Eastern Zone began to exhibit some of the patterns that had been evident elsewhere for several years. In August, 71 Hanoi trained Khmer cadres from all over the zone were assembled for a study course in Region 21. Kampong One of them, Hem Samin, H-E-M-S-A-M-I-N, and this references an interview that Mr. Kiernan had with Hem Samin in Phnom Penh on the 28th of September 1980. One of them, Hem Samin, recalls that they were lectured by Puong, P-H-U-O-N-G, and Region Secretary Chan. Huang then informed the group that they were now in detention and had to stay where we were in order to be self-reliant until the organization came up with a solution so that we could go back to work. Ten of the prisoners soon disappeared allegedly taken to carry out duties somewhere else. The other 61 
including salmon, were put to work in the fields under close supervision. They enjoyed some freedom of movement, however, and Puong statement suggests that the Eastern Zone executives did not wish to rule out a future role for them. By contrast, only six of their colleagues were still alive in jail in the South West. Hundreds of others had been executed since 1971. On the 27th of August 1980. Mr. Kiernan, in giving a conclusion on the Eastern Zone, on English page 0048751. The Khmer page Khmer may be, but I'm not entirely sure, 0010488. Mr. Kiernan states as follows. The evacuation of towns like Krache, Kampong Trache, Angkasom, and Kompong Kdai in 1973 was not an abnormal measure at the height of the bombardment. It also provided the CPK with a precedent to push further ahead to take advantage of this momentum and mobilize the population for more communism, even after the bombardment had stopped. The democratic revolution was both a product of and a capitalization upon the U.S. aerial war. ในจับเปิ้ลเนี่ยตัวเต้อโหดมองดอก